some dressy people in here. <laughs> Regardless of what you're wearing, you look great. Yeah. Okay, so we have fun, exciting announcements. Are you guys ready? Okay. Men's Advance. <laughs> Men don't retreat. So you're going to advance into the, mount the mountains with the Kluth cabin people. So um, if you are a boy, please write these dates down. You do not want to miss this weekend. It's <laughs> or a man. <laughs> oh, Lord. If you're able to grow facial hair. <laughs> okay, write these dates down, okay? I really don't know what goes on. Uh, I know that it's great and that when men go, they enjoy it. So you should go. It's Friday through Sunday, April 9th through 11th. The cost is $75, okay? You stay in an epic cabin built by the, the four hands of my in-laws. It's amazing. And you get to eat meat and probably shoot stuff. So $75, okay, so please write that in your phone and make note of it, okay? Plan to go. It's going to be great. And then we have women's retreats. Yay! Uh, women, women's retreat is amazing, okay? Um, I fell in love with Chi Alpha because I went to a women's retreat uh, with Chi Alpha, and um, I'm here today, so... Um, that is going to be the following weekend, Friday through Sunday, April 16th through 18th. And we are flying in an amazing Chi Alpha missionary from Sam Houston State um, named Sultana. And she's an amazing, amazing person. And she's going to come and invest in us for a whole weekend. So, um, yeah, so write that, those dates down. Please come. You don't want to miss it. If you miss it, you're going to be really, really sad. Trust me. Um, also, $75, and that includes, um, we're also staying at the cabin and food and stuff like that. So it's going to be great. Cool. Um, okay, so how many of you remember we did a missions trip to New Mexico State? Yeah. It was really cool. So um, it was an amazing, amazing week. So we're going to have two people come up and, and talk about it. So we have Mark and Destiny. Can you guys welcome them up? Hey guys. So yeah, last week we went on a missions trip to NMSU, which is uh, yeah. I was told to I was told to dress fancy and also wear the NMSU shirt, so I had to compromise and do both. <laughs> so at the beginning of the week, uh, we were told, "Hey, we're gonna go on campus and we're gonna talk to people about Jesus." And I was a nervous wreck; like I could not handle that emotionally and psychologically. So I asked for a lot of prayer. I asked for prayer for the uh, ex-amen. I asked for prayer for my church. Um, and by the end of the week, I felt like I owned that campus. I could talk to anybody uh, about the Bible, Jesus, at any point. That is only through the power of prayer. The Holy Spirit did a work in my heart, for sure. Um, so that alone was probably the biggest thing that I took away from that. Um, they, the, the Chi Alpha there is a lot different than ours, surprisingly. They're a lot older, they have a lot more things established, um, and just learning the way that they do things and seeing the way they do things and how they handle um, things like LTC was kind of eye-opening. So um, we're just hoping um, as, a, as a group that went to kind of bring some of that um, here with us. So um, tonight, even before we had this meeting, we met downstairs, thanks to Destiny, had a prayer meeting, um, and actually, you know, um, pr uh, prayed corporately, and that's only because we 
experienced that in uh, NMSU Chi Alpha. So anyway, lots of crazy things, awesome stuff happened there, and I would highly suggest going on a missions trip if you can at any point. Um, it was life-changing for me, and um, I, yeah, big thing I learned is that it was a lot more about my personal growth as a Christian, growing closer to God and learning how to do the work and how to be yoked up to Jesus um, than it was actually engaging with people on that campus. Not that that was a bad thing either, but um, anyway, that's my story. So let's give it up for Destiny. I'm Destiny, for all of you who don't know me. Um, yeah, so I went on the NMSU trip, and it was really amazing. I have, like, so much to say about it, so you should find me afterwards, and I'll talk to you about it. Um, anyways, but I think the biggest takeaway was, um, yeah, you go on to missions trip and trips, and you have, like, no idea how much God is going to, like, move through you and, like, move in your life, and you don't really expect to be impacted, but I really was. Um, so I went on this trip not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life. Um, <laughs> I graduated in December, and so I was like, yo, God, like, you should really fill me in on what I'm doing with my life. Um, and so that's been something that I've been dealing with since, like, July-ish. And so, like, on that trip, I just really, like, fell in love with God, like, all over again. It was so cool. And um, after a small group on Monday, it was, like, an amazing small group, and I learned so much. Um, <laughs> I came back to Jimena's house, we were staying with her, and um, Ashley said something about, like, why don't you come back to NMSU? You, like, like it so much. And I was like, okay, let me think about that for a hot minute. Um, and so then I went to the couch, sat down, and started crying my eyeballs out. Um, <laughs> and I decided that I am supposed to devote I guess the next year of my life after I graduate to God, um, yeah, I'm planning on going and doing the internship at NMSU. So, <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> yeah um, so I just like to encourage people. I know I was waiting for God for a really long time, past even July. So if you're waiting on God for answers, he gives it to you in his time. I know if he told me that like a week before, I would have been like, nah, God, like I can't do this. But like he gave it to me in his perfect timing. Um, yeah, so it was an awesome trip. And I'd love to talk to every single one of you about this. But yeah, I 10 out of 10, like a million times recommend going on a missions trip. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs> The whole team was um, greatly impacted. We only had time for two. So yeah, if you guys want to find anybody who went on that trip, Jada, um, O'Burke, um, Jake, the, the big one, not baby, <laughs> big, big bro Burke. Um, yeah, so definitely uh, make it a priority to go on a trip. Um, it is a sacrifice, but um, it is so good. Um, and definitely worth the sacrifice. So yeah, talk to anybody. Hmm? And Audrey. Audrey went too. Yes. Sorry. She was way back there. Cool. So as you guys know, we are doing um, honor bombs. Yeah, and it's so fun. So this week we have um, O'Burk and Benji honoring people today. So would you guys um, welcome them up? And they're going to honor some peeps. He needs like a red carpet for this ensemble. I don't know. I don't know why you guys are looking at me weird. I'm just dressed up like you guys. All right, this is this is planned. Everybody knew this. I don't. Thank you, Benji. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people in here I value a lot and would want to honor. But uh, today I'm going to honor Jacob, Jacob Peck. Um, I really got to know Jacob over the last year. I didn't know him too well prior to about January 2020. Um, but yeah, in that year and up to now, it's just been um, really awesome to get to know this man and to just see what the Lord has done in his life 
And I can truly say that the Lord has used Jacob Peck to impact mine and to grow me a lot. So um, I'm, I'm an emotional speaker, so I'm just going <laughs> to bear with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jacob, you embody what it means to live by example. Um, you're not going to tell somebody to do something you're not willing to do first. And you're not going to tell somebody how to live their lives um, without living your life accordingly. Um, you know, just your example at small group and the way you're, you're able to share your struggles and the way you just, you, there's no sense of, you have no sense of superiority over the group. You just kind of bear your soul and, um, you know, lead with a, just a humility of heart. Um, when you discover that you've uh, done something wrong, you, you repent and you, you learn from it and you just swear you won't do it again and you just move on and live a holier life and just watching your you know, consistent growth and just consistent repentance and consistent uh, example is just really uh, something we you know, can all learn from and it's all something that every Christian should really embody I think is just just always having an open mind um, always being willing to change and always being willing to repent and grow. Um, and then also just really I love your heart and how you just embrace what God's doing, no matter what it looks like, you know, and just like, like with the house and like with the people in it and, you know, things happen that are unexpected and you're just all about it, you know? And so, um, I probably have a thousand more things I could say, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. And just, um, I just, Praise God that you're in my life, and I love you greatly. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I always... Okay, sorry. <clears throat> so the person I'd like to honor this week is Sam. Woo! Sam Schmidt. <laughs> yeah, so... Sam... So the reason that I wanted to honor you is, one, is easy, um, you're amazing, um, but two, is because when I, when I think about you, I think about the verse John 15, 12, which states, my commandment is this, love each other as I have loved you. And as a person who has had a very rough life and doesn't really like embrace compliments or like love very well, I just, I just want you guys to like just realize that like it takes a lot to get through me and Sam you're an amazing example of how to love people because I feel loved by you all the time and if you guys just like if you guys need anybody or you're new to Chi Alpha like go to Sam because she makes you feel special loved and just cared for and that love is only will only able through God and it's just amazing just the amount of love that she gives to everyone whether they love her back or don't and it's amazing so thank you Sam for being an amazing example yes yeah cool don't you guys love honor bombs this is good Cool. Well, um, honor Duncan as he comes up to talk to us tonight. He's an amazing preacher, and he's been preparing. So clap and welcome our friend. <laughs> Man, that was the best forced clap I've ever heard in my life. That's awesome. Destiny, that is amazing that you want to do the internship. Really, really cool. Um, some of you maybe formed a little question mark over your head when you said, I'm going to do the Chi Alpha internship. Just so you know, um, we have about 300 Chi Alphas across the nation, okay? And uh, about 30 of them have an internship program. And a Chi Alpha internship is really cool. You do it after you graduate, and it teaches you how to be in ministry full time. And it specifically, like, puts you on the college campus. And... 
it's really cool. It's like the doorway into a lifetime of ministry, which is really cool. Um, I did the internship. Peter did the internship. Um, there's a couple of people in the room who want to do it as well that I've heard. And um, we're actually, just as of yesterday, have applied to have one here, which is really cool. So keep that in the back of your mind. Good prayer point that we would get one. It would be really awesome. So, hey, how are you guys doing? Good. It's good to see you guys. Real spread out tonight. Looks good. Everybody have a good spring break? Yeah? We heard about the New Mexico guys. Pretty awesome. We were praying for you guys the whole time. But anybody, anybody do anything of, of note over spring break? Anybody make any memories? or No. <laughs> I just worked. No, that's cool. I, we had fun here. The power went out for like a day, so I took my kids sledding. It was awesome. Um, my four-year-old is like a beast on the slopes. It's amazing. So she's going to be a skier, I guess. But uh, um, We are back, and it's awesome. I don't know if you guys know this. We have like five weeks of classes left. Can you believe that? There's like five weeks of classes left. And then there's finals, and then the summer. <laughs> like it goes by so fast. Um, so for those of you that are new to Chi Alpha, uh, just so you know, we don't stop in the summer. It just looks a little different. Usually we're hanging out at somebody's house or, um, you know, we're, we're in a park or something like that. So if you're planning on sticking around this summer, we'll still be going. We probably won't be in here, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, tonight we are going to get back into our series on Jesus and the Feast of Israel. We only have two of these left till we finish the series. There's seven feasts, and tonight's going to be a good one. You guys been enjoying this series? Pretty good. I remember several weeks ago we talked about, like, this is a meaty series. You remember that? It's like this is one of those, this is like a set of sermons that when you hear it, you got to, like, take notes. You're just not going to remember it, right? Because there's just so much. Um, you know, Jesus fulfilled the meaning of the feasts of Israel that they'd been practicing for hundreds of years, Right? And when the Messiah came, when Jesus came, he showed them what these feasts actually were about. Right? For hundreds of years, they were, it, it was like a prelude to what was going to happen. Right? And um, this has just been an amazing series. I've grown. I've taken notes. Every night that I'm not preaching, I'm taking notes, and I'm learning, and I'm growing. So I hope that you are too. Um, what I love about this series also is that we see that the entire Bible is in harmony you know, some people like to only read the New Testament. Oh, I just don't understand the Old Testament. You know, they're like, it's too confusing. So you just never crack it open. But I think this was said a few weeks ago, but it is my conviction that you can find Jesus on every page of the Bible. I really do believe that. And that's kind of how this series came about, because we can see Jesus and his character on every single page of the Bible. Um, we can put that first slide up there. Just kind of, we're going to do a little review. Um, just right before spring break, Lori, my wife, she, she brought the message that night. She talked about the Feast of Trumpets. You guys remember that? It was pretty awesome. It was good. It was awesome. If you missed it, it's on YouTube. Let's go to YouTube. Um, but, uh, man, we're almost done. We went through the spring feast. You remember that? And Lori, last week, she talked about this summer harvest, right? And this, this harvest that takes place and the end of the harvest season is signified by the blowing of trumpets, right? And she talked about how the, the fall feasts are the feasts that signify Jesus' return, right? The first, the, the spring feasts, he's already fulfilled in his first coming. But we know, we as the church believe that he's going to come again, right? He's going to come again. And when he comes again, he's going to fulfill these last three. Um, so the Feast of Trumpets was awesome. Um, let's just review these real quick, and then we're going to get into the meat of tonight, right? And so if you're ready to take notes, get ready to take some notes. You can put it on your phone or whatever. This is going to be good stuff. So way back in February, we started this series, and we talked about the Feast of Passover, right? And we talked about how Jesus is our Passover lamb. Do you remember that? And, and uh, by the way, they're doing construction up there tonight, so if you hear stuff, you, you know, that's what it is. So um, Jesus is our Passover lamb. Right? The, it, this was a celebration of Israel's exodus out of Egypt, right? And do you remember what they had to do? They had to paint their doorposts with the blood of a lamb. And if they did, the, the angel of death would pass over them, right? It's so obvious how Jesus fulfilled this, right? 
We talked about it that night. Then we talked about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and how for a week Israel was called to just eat unleavened bread. Not only that, but they were, they were supposed to clean their entire houses of leaven. And of course, we, we learned that night that leaven represents sin, right? And, that we, and, and how did Jesus fulfill that? He, he became sin for us. And if we put our trust in him, our lives are cleaned of all the leaven as well. Um, we talked about, Peter preached after that, he talked about the Feast of First Fruits and how it was an offering to the Lord, right? It was an offering to signify our gratefulness to God. And Jesus fulfills this by resurrecting from the dead. So not only did he become sin, but he beat death as well. That's pretty awesome, right? Um, then we talked about the Feast of Pentecost and how this was 50 days after First Fruits and it was another offering it was another offering to God to show God that we are grateful for you, Lord. We recognize that you are our provider, right? And uh, how did Jesus fulfill this? He sent the Holy Spirit. You remember in the offering, there were these two leavened loaves of bread, and they came to signify two people groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. And it was on that day for the first time in history that we learned that Jesus is not just for Israel, but Jesus is for the whole world. Isn't that awesome? And then there's this long summer harvest. And that's where we are right now. We are laborers in God's field, right? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are, free, are few. And Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. And that's where we are right now. That's why we do what we do. That's why these guys went on the mission trip. Because they believe in laboring in the fields for God. And then Lori did the Feast of Trumpets, and we already covered that. So tonight... Tonight we're going to talk about, you can put this up there, we're going to talk about the Feast of Atonement. The Feast of Atonement. Now, tonight is going to be a little bit heavier, right? While, this, while the Feast of Trumpets was a celebration of the new year, right, and we believe Jesus is going to fulfill this when he returns, right? The whole world will know he's returning by the blowing of trumpets, and, and Jesus is going to fulfill this meaning. But, but this is a much different day. The Day of Atonement in Hebrew is called Yom Kippur. And um, I want to lay the foundation before we get into the details of what they did on this day. Because there's a lot of stuff they did on this day that to us in 21st century America may seem really odd to us. But before I get into all those details, I want to lay the foundation on why this day was necessary. I mean, we can talk about why they did it, but if we don't understand the meaning, it's like, okay, well, good for them, right? But let's talk about the meaning on why this was important, okay? See, the Day of Atonement had a very particular purpose. Um, that word atonement tells us what this day was about. That's it right there. If we separate the word out, the etymology there is at one meant. So atonement means unity with God. Atonement means oneness with God. We are one with God. We're perfectly in love with him, in fellowship with him. Our purpose in life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And um, we talk about working for the harvest, but our ultimate purpose is to have fellowship with God, right? A relaxed love relationship with God. We've talked about that before. That's our purpose in life. But you see, there's a problem, there's a problem with this. God is perfect, right? And he is holy. And to be in his presence, we are also required to be perfect and holy. That's a requirement of fellowship. A perfect God will not tolerate sin. The perfect cannot have unity with the imperfect. Does everybody understand this? We're, we're like wrapping our heads around this. We're laying the foundation here. And this, this is where we find the problem. Because of our sin, we are disqualified for having true unity with God. We're disqualified already. And you may be thinking, well, I'm not sinful. Actually, you are. <laughs> Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that includes you. That includes me too. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
See, every one of us here tonight and everyone in the world shares in this problem. Because of our sin, we are separated from God. And therefore, we are separated from our ultimate purpose, which is perfect unity with God. Um, there's a street preacher I really like. His name is Jesse Morell, and he said this. You can put this quote up there. He says this, The Bible calls us to hate evil and love righteousness, just as God hates evil and loves righteousness. There's nothing worth hating in righteousness, and there's nothing worth loving in sin. The church of Jesus Christ needs to get a holy love for righteousness and a holy hatred for sin. See, we're supposed to hate sin because it's what keeps us from this unity with God. Our sin keeps us from perfect fellowship with God, and that's our purpose in life. Brent talked about this a few weeks ago. Remember we had Brent here from CSU, and he said, if you find yourself caught in a certain sin that you can't get out of, it simply means that you don't hate that sin. <laughs> you secretly love it. Because of our sin, we are separated from a holy God. And you see, because God is holy and because he's righteous, God actually has the responsibility to rid the world of sin. That's his job. Because he is perfect, because he is righteous, because he is holy, he has to rid the world of sin. And I hope you guys believe this, that our world is evil. Our world is very evil. Our world is not good. I, I hear this all the time, that people are basically good, right? And uh, there's just a few bad people out there. And actually, the opposite, the Bible makes the case that the opposite is true. And I want to make that case for you tonight. I, you know, we were all mortified this week with the news that we saw come out of Boulder, weren't we? Right? An evil, sinful man, full of sin, went into a grocery store in Boulder, just a little over an hour from here, and killed 10 people. Our world has fallen. You just have to turn on the news and see that this is true, right? We do not live in a basically good world. And by the way, we are what makes this world evil. God didn't create this world to be evil. We are the ones that, that make it evil. We made the world evil. And because God has the responsibility to rid the world of evil, that means he has to rid the world of us. I mean, it just makes sense, right? If we're all full of sin and he has to rid the world of evil, that means he has to rid the world of us. However, God loves us. It's this great dilemma that we find throughout Scripture that we deserve hell but yet God loves us, so what do we do with that? Okay? How do we save man? You know, the Bible declares in Genesis 126 and 127 that we were made in the image of God after his own likeness. And by the way, did you know that nothing else in creation that can be said about? Not the trees, not the animals, not, not you know, objects or whatever, TV <laughs> shows, Nothing was made in the image of God except for us. And because of that, God loves us. We are the apple of his eye. So God has a dilemma. In order to rid the world of evil, he has to rid the world of us. But how can he rid the world of evil without destroying us forever? This dilemma and God's solution to this dilemma is found in the feast of or the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Atonement. And by the way, this is still celebrated throughout the world to this day on Yom Kippur. If you look at a calendar that's usually printed on the calendar somewhere, right? Um, this is still celebrated. So this dilemma, by the way, is, is not anything that's new. This has been throughout history. You can put this first slide up there. I think it's the next slide. It goes all the way back to the story of Adam and Eve, the first humans that decided to rebel against God. You remember the story, right? Um, Adam and Eve were given dominion in the garden, and, and they were to rule and reign over that garden and live in perfect harmony and perfect fellowship and perfect oneness with God. And God gave them a boundary and said, as long as you don't transgress this boundary, we can have fellowship. 
but yet they chose to do what God told them not to do. Right? Some people like to blame it on the devil. I mean, the devil deceived them, but they ultimately made the choice to do it. Right? And by the way, uh, sometimes your Bibles, when, when you read the story of Adam and Eve, when they sinned, it's Genesis chapter 3, you'll see in there, it'll say, the fall of man. C.S. Lewis, you heard of C.S. Lewis before? You know, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He's a great theologian. C.S. Lewis makes a great point. He says, it shouldn't be called the fall of man as if man was just walking through the garden one day and like tripped on a root and fell. Whoops. And then God, you know, put sin in the world because they, they accidentally tripped or something. It's not the fall of man. It actually should be called the rebellion of man. See, God told them what not to do, and they chose to do it anyway. They rebelled against God. And so mankind was cast out of the garden and sentenced to toil with the land. And although they had paradise, they gave up paradise for their own selfishness. And this sin curse was passed down to their children. Put this next slide up there. We see this passed, passed down into Cain and Abel. The first murder recorded in Holy Scripture is when Cain killed his brother Abel. And this is never meant to be how, how creation was supposed to be. This is not what God designed. God did not intend for us to live this way, but because he loves us and gives us a free will choice, ultimately mankind decided to put himself above God's mandate. Um, many times throughout the Old Testament leading up to the Exodus, we actually see that the world gets so evil that God, like, relents, and he's like, I'm, I'm done with this, <laughs> right? We see this kind of alluded to in Noah's flood. He's like, I, I'm, I'm done with this, you know. Not that he made a mistake. We're the ones that made the mistake, by the way. <laughs> but he's like, he's like I'm just going to start over because these guys screwed it up. And, but in his mercy... And in his love and in his grace, we see salvation in, in Noah's ark, right? Him and his family were allowed to survive, and mankind was allowed to continue. Um, it was God's mercy that brought Jacob and his family out of famine and into Egypt. We see God's mercy on display. We see God's mercy when he chose Israel, and God would show the world what a people group looks like that isn't known for anything else except the people that walk with him. I remember being a young Christian asking this question, like, why did God choose Israel in the Old Testament? Like, why didn't he choose Egypt or Babylon and some of these great societies that, that, that added these great, you know, the, these uh, the knowledge to the world and these great buildings and architecture? Like, why didn't God, why did God choose Israel? And the answer is, is because Israel had nothing to offer. They didn't even have a homeland. They were just a couple families <laughs> that had nothing to offer. They would only be known as the people who walked with God. They wouldn't be known for their great cities, their great societies, right? Their great knowledge and mathematics and like other societies. They were only known as the people who walked with God. And we see God's mercy in choosing Israel. So how was it that this rebellious group of people, and by the way, Israel, even though they were chosen by God, doesn't mean that they're like holier than thou. They messed up a lot. They rebelled against God constantly, and God would punish them for it. So how was it that this rebellious group of people, this rebellious nation was able to maintain their fellowship with a holy God, even though they themselves were full of sin? And that's where we're going to get into the meat of tonight. So if you're taking notes, this is a good place to start. Leviticus 23. We find the instructions for the Feast of Atonement in Leviticus 23, starting in verse 26. I'm just going to read through this real quick. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also in the tenth day of the seventh month shall, the day, shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offering, and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, and you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. 
You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all of your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls. On the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. See, atonement, what we just read here, or at one makes us one with God by repenting of our sins. By repenting of our sins. By the way, repentance isn't just feeling sorry for your sins. I've heard that a lot. That isn't true. Repentance is turning from your sin. Right? It's going in one direction, and when you repent, you literally stop and you turn around and go the opposite direction. It's a change of mind is the literal Greek there. Metanoia, the change of mind. Repentance of sin. The only way to maintain a relationship with the holy God is to be clean before God. And on this day, Israel was commanded to afflict their souls. It was the day that Israel would look at their lives and cry out to God for forgiveness of everything that they had done that displeased the Lord. Atonement meant to humble yourself before the Lord. We've said this before several times this school year, but remember humility. Humility is a sober sense of reality. You know, so far tonight when I've been up here talking, if you aren't sobered up by what we've talked about, shake yourself up. Humility is a sober sense of reality. When you understand the severity of our sin and understand how holy God is and where we stand before him, it causes us to be humble. So it's a day of confession and repentance. So I want to unpack some of these details about what happened at this annual feast. Um, We're going to start to see how God was alluding to his people what his ultimate plan was going to be. Right? So there's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of things that they would do that may not make sense to us today, but when we study the life of Jesus, they start to make sense. Okay, so I want to read from Leviticus 16. And it's a long chapter, but I'm, I'm going to try to chop it up. I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to stop. I'm going to talk. Then I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to stop. I'm going to talk. Okay? So we're going to get through Leviticus 16 because these details are so important. So we're going to start reading here. Verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come in just at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So if you come before the Lord casually, this is what what God is warning them. (laughs) He starts out by warning them. He says, don't just come casually into my presence, because my presence is going to be manifest over the Ark of the Covenant. See, right there at the Holy of Holies, at the middle of the temple was the Ark of the Covenant, right? You remember remember that from like movies and stuff? It had the Ten Commandments in it. It had a bunch of other stuff in it. And, And God's presence on the Day of Atonement would be manifest at the mercy seat, which is the top right there in between the two angel wings, right? And God's presence would be manifest there. And he warns him and he says, if you come in just casually, you're going to die. And actually, verse 1 says that actually happened <laughs> with, with Aaron's sons. They come in casually and they just fall over and die. <laughs> what does that say about God's holiness, right? God's presence can kill people. It's crazy to think about. Anyway, let's keep reading. Go to the next slide. Verse 3. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with, blood, with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body with water and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kinds of the, sorry, two kids of the goats as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. So see, even before the high priest Aaron could come into the presence of God, he had to be clean himself. And so there's a lot of symbolism here. He'd put on these fine linens, right? Uh, these, these cloths and this, this turban, right? And he would actually bring in an offering for himself first, an offering for him and his family. 
And that offering would happen, the sacrifice would happen, and then he would be considered clean before God. So let's keep reading. Verse 6. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, we just said that, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. We're going to get into that in just a second, the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now, this is really, when we just read this casually, you're like, what? <laughs> what is he talking about, right? I want to break this down for a second. So Aaron is supposed to take these two young goats from the people and one goat shall be the sacrifice and the other goat is what's called the scapegoat. In Hebrew, it's Azazel, the scapegoat, right? And on this goat, the sins of Israel would be transferred from the people onto the head of the goat. And then the goat would be sent out in the wilderness, never to return. Isn't that funny? So they would lay their hands on the head of this goat, and the sins of the people would be transferred onto the head of this goat, and they would send the goat out into the wilderness. That's where we get the term scapegoat. That's where it originated. Um, all right, let's keep reading. We have a lot to get through. Verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall kill the bull and the sin offering, which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals from the fire. For, uh, fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil and he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die. So here God is repeating himself. Remember, my presence will kill you. This is the day that I appear before you and if you just treat it casually, you'll die. So here's how you protect yourself. You take this incense and, and, and coals from the fire and, and this smoke cloud would rise up and it would, it would shield Aaron or the high priest from God's presence. Because if God's presence was fully manifest without this, Aaron would surely die. Verse 14, go to the next one. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. If you don't like blood and stuff, that you're starting to cringe a little. Like, oh, this is weird, you know. So Aaron takes the blood of the bull that was sacrificed with his finger, and he sprinkles some of this blood on the mercy seat and on the side. And he does this seven times. Now, there is significance to this. this. Sure, it seems weird, but there's significance to this. The significance of the sprinkling of the blood. We know that in the Bible, sprinkling represents offering. And we're going to see that in a minute. There's a lot of scripture that talks about this. But let's get through this. We're almost done. Verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the bull's blood, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness." There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar and all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So we see a lot of this continuing of sprinkling of the blood, not just at the mercy seat now, but on the altar and all around. By the way, this is not supposed to be a beautiful sight. This is supposed to be horrific. You're supposed to look at this and think about your sin and what sin does. 
Verse 20, And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to, to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. So you remember these, these two goats were brought up from among the people to the altar. One was sacrificed, his blood was sprinkled, the other was kept alive. And for, we, just, we just read this again, so God is, is, is again summarizing. Again, transfer your sins, the sins of the people, onto the head of this goat and send it out in the wilderness. The scapegoat will be brought out in the wilderness and let go. And in this, in this action, we see Israel's sins symbolically being removed from them. Isn't that cool? Their sins would be removed from them onto the scapegoat. And, and this is significant because it's one thing to confess your sins. It's a whole other thing to get rid of them. Right? Confession of sin is not enough. Because we could all confess sin tonight. Yes, that's the first step. But God wants us to remove it from our lives. That's what's important about this. <laughs> I've actually learned in later traditions, not only would they send the goat out into the wilderness, but then they would kind of push it off a cliff. Because <laughs> they didn't want this goat to like ever come back into the camp. Because it's like this filthy goat now, right? Um, God would remove the sins of Israel through the scapegoat. Now, if you know Jesus, and if you love Jesus, you're already beginning to see the parallels, aren't you? You're already beginning to see how Jesus fulfilled the meaning of the Day of Atonement. Let's finish up here. Verse 23. Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting, take off the linen garments which he put on, and went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place, put on his garments, come out, and offer a burnt offering and burnt of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar and he who released the goat and as the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and afterward he may come up into the camp the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place shall be carried outside the camp and they shall burn in the fire of their skins their flesh and their offal then he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come back into the camp. So after this is all done, we see all these strange rituals that were done, and we finally see this, verse 29. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes and holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So all the sins of Israel, whether they be the priest's sins, the sins that covered the land, the sins of the common people, all the sins were cleaned and man could be found in right standing before God again. Now, I want us to understand something. And what we just read, this annual cleansing of this purging of sin from Israel, this annual day of atonement, I want, to, I want us to really get this. This was only a temporary solution. This was only a temporary solution. God reminds us through the author of Hebrews in the New Testament, so this is the letters written after Jesus was resurrected. In Hebrews chapter 10, you can put this up there, it says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly after every year, make perfect who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? 
For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So, although we know this symbolism ran really deep, and Israel was meant to understand the severity of their sins, I mean, there's a lot of blood involved, right? We're supposed to understand the severity of our sins, but the sacrifices were not meant to be a permanent solution. In fact, some of the prophets of the Old Testament write about how Israel's sacrifices had become meaningless before God. This annual day, Israel started taking advantage of this. In their minds, they're like, well, Day of Atonement's coming. We can just do what we want and then transfer it all to this goat, right? And we're good. But the prophets of Israel remind them that this has become meaningless. Why even do it, do it at all? 500 years after what we just read happened, after the instructions were given, 500 years later, this prophet Isaiah comes. Proph the prophet Isaiah is raised up by God to remind Israel that they, they, they don't get it. You don't understand why this happens every year, and I'm going to remind you why. Um, he starts out his whole book by this. Put this up there. Isaiah 1. Starting in verse 10, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitudes of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to, me appear before, when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. <laughs> this is God speaking, right? Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me, and I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are just full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet... They shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. You see, God had a plan. In God's mercy, he still is enacting a way for God's people to be saved. In his mercy, we see that God never stopped loving his people. And although his people had stopped loving him, he never stopped loving them because he has unconditional love for us. God would set in motion his ultimate plan. Enter the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, right? Come on. Now, I want to propose to you tonight that Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, fulfilled the meaning and the purpose of the Day of Atonement. And we learned many weeks ago from Peter when he preached on the Passover that Jesus is our sacrifice. He's our Passover lamb. The sacrifices that were made annually on the Day of Atonement, Jesus became that ultimate and final sacrifice. And it was his sacrifice that made atonement for us forever. Um, we learned just a few minutes ago that Aaron would start, uh, that he was the high priest, he would start uh, by entering the temple and atoning for his sins first and his family. And he would do that, and he would come out, and then he would go back in for the rest of the people. So Aaron entered the Holy of Holies twice. He entered the temple twice. Now, this was a foreshadowing of Jesus. We learn this in Hebrews chapter 7. By the way, just a little nugget. If you read Hebrews, it's good to be familiar with the Feast of Atonement. Because the author of Hebrews, we're not sure who it was, but the author of Hebrews answers the Feast of Atonement 
throughout the book and brings it into light for us today. So Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 26, I've got a slide for this. It says, such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the, above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, for, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men and all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has made perfect forever. Jesus is our high priest. Isn't that cool? We read earlier tonight about the two goats that were brought up from among the people. And each of these young goats was a foreshadow of what the Son of God, Jesus, would be for us. Remember, one goat was sacrificed, and that sacrifice is found in the Lamb of God. We learn that the blood of this goat was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Do you remember that? The sprinkling in the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence dwelled, that unless you're careful with, you will die in his presence, right? Jesus fulfilled this by the sprinkling of his blood upon us all. First Peter, put this up there. First Peter 1, 1 through 2. This is written after the resurrection. The disciple Peter writes a letter and he says this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 52 13 through 15 says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Now the other goat... The scapegoat, you remember, bore the sins upon his head, all the sins of Israel, and sent away. Jesus, the Son of God, became our scapegoat when he washed us white as snow by taking on the sins of us. You see, the blood of Jesus doesn't just cover our sins. The blood of Jesus washes away our sins. I fully believe this. I know you've, it's, it's been said, you know, be covered by blood, and I don't disagree with that, but I believe we are washed. When the blood of Jesus comes into our life, we are washed, and we become white as snow. Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The scapegoat Jesus. Just as the sins of Israel were laid upon the head of the scapegoat, the iniquities of us all were laid on the head of Jesus, right? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we learned that after all the sins were transferred to the head of this live goat, the goat was sent out into the wilderness symbolically removing the sins from the camp. Well, we find this answered in Psalm 103, 11 and 12. It says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So just as the scapegoat went out into the wilderness with the sins, Jesus has removed our sins from us. Say it again, come on. You see, Jesus fulfilled every aspect of the day of atonement by his first coming. His fulfillment of that great day comes at his death and burial and resurrection. And we are atoned for through Jesus uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6 says, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 
For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This is our atonement. This is how we are made one with God. All right? You guys doing okay? Whew, it's heavy. It's heavy. You're taking notes. You'll be good. I don't expect you to remember all this tonight, by the way. It's good to take notes. you remember it later. Okay, now not only did Jesus fulfill the meaning of the Feast of Atonement on his first coming, but he will ultimately fulfill it when he returns, when he comes again. Um, last time we met together, just before spring break, Lori talked about the Feast of Trumpets, and, and the Feast of Trumpets ushers in the new year, right? And it's a day of celebration, and Jesus will fulfill this when he returns, we believe in the imminent return of Jesus, meaning it can happen at any moment. No one knows when. We're not supposed to be date setters, by the way. If you ever come across somebody that says, Jesus is coming back on this day, they're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong because we're not supposed to know when he's coming back, but he's coming back. Now, if you love Jesus, this day of the Lord that's talked about throughout the Old and New Testament this Feast of Trumpets that Lori talked about is something that you can't wait for. It's like, it's like the ultimate joy when Jesus returns, if you love Jesus. However, if you don't love Jesus, if you love your sin more than you love Jesus, if you don't have a holy hatred for sin, the holy day of the Lord of his return will be a terrible day for you. It will be a terrible day. This is what the Bible says. Because not only is Jesus returning to take his people, he's also returning to judge the living and the dead. He's coming to judge. Yes, he judges, by the way. And by the way, he's the only one qualified to judge, right? Because he's perfect. <laughs> so he, he's allowed to judge. He's our creator. Um. You see, we started out tonight by talking about how the world is evil. You remember that? The world is filled with evil. And our Western American culture is at the forefront of this evil. We perpetuate in our society, we perpetuate this evil around the world. I mean, sometimes it's disgusting. I can't even watch like award shows anymore. It's disgusting. Because we perpetuate it. And we call it good. And we say this is what we want to be like. And it's, it's, it's detestable. While the return of Jesus is a joyous moment for those that are in Christ, the return of Jesus is a terrible day for those that do not belong to Christ. It's a terrible day. Now, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 25. I want to put this up there. This is a heavy verse. He says this. Now, this is coming from the mouth of Jesus. He says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you, ma you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did on the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he goes on, verse, 40, verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these, 
You did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. See, there will be a day where Jesus judges the living and the dead. The, the, the dead will be raised and judged according to Jesus' standards. And whoever is not found to belong to Christ, together with the devil and his angels, the beast and the false prophet, which we're not going to get into tonight, it's too much, will be consigned to the everlasting punishment in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And we call this the second death. Revelation 20, 11 through 15 says this. This is John, by the way. John of Patmos, and he's in exile. He's been kicked out of society because he's a Christian. And he's writing to the churches. And he says, this is what's coming, guys. <laughs> Get ready. In verse 11, he says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in these books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and, the death, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. See, Jesus is our judge. Yes, he is our God. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. But he is also our judge. And he's a righteous judge. Some judges are corrupt. But he's a good judge. He judges rightly. Right? And he's the only one that's qualified to do this. I, I, can't, do, I can't sit on that throne and, and judge. I can't do it. I'm not qualified. But Jesus is. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11 says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are, we are well known to God. And I also trust that we are well known in your consciousness. See, we must give an account of our lives. We find ourselves belonging to Christ or we find ourselves face to face with the judgment of God. And that's not a place I want to be. 1 John 3, 4 through 6. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Remember the scapegoat. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or know him. These are hard verses, right? Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, it says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifices for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God? Underfoot, Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sacrificed them? And who has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, I think it's pertinent um, that we stop for a moment. Let's think about what Brent said a few weeks ago, if you remember. He came and talked about the fear of the Lord. You remember that? The fear of the Lord, how to rightfully understand the fear of the Lord. I can tell you, when I read verses like this, it puts the fear of the Lord in me, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> it puts the fear of the Lord in me. But for those of you here tonight that love Jesus and who strive to please him, and allowed his blood to cleanse you, you have every reason to wait for anticipation and joy at his second coming. You have nothing to worry about because you're made clean 
by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For all of us, may we let the Lamb of God atone for our sins. So tonight, we're going to start to wrap up here. We learned a lot about the rituals of the Day of Atonement, didn't we? While many of these th things, they, they seem foreign to us, and, and it's like, it's one of those things, like when I read through Leviticus 23, I don't ever want to be there. <laughs> I don't want to see that. I don't want to see, like, these animals slaughtered and the blood, like, thrown everywhere. I don't want to see that. And when you read this, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable. Like, you're supposed to feel queasy when you read this because it's supposed to cause you to hate your sin. It shows you what sin, what, what, what the result of sin is. This is the result of sin, right? Now, because of Jesus, we no longer need the sacrifice of bulls and goats to atone for our sins. On the cross, Jesus uttered these words. He says, it is finished. It is finished. Jesus is our ultimate atoning sacrifice. And through his atoning sacrifice, we can become righteous before God again. It can happen. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So our response tonight is confession and repentance. Our response, and this is for everyone here, our response is confession and repentance. Now, although we aren't required to perform these atoning rituals in Leviticus anymore, the Lord Jesus did leave us with two rituals that we are still commanded to do this day. And these two ordinances, we call them ordinances, these two ordinances of the church are baptism and communion. These are the only two rituals that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. We celebrated baptisms, right, a few weeks ago, and that was awesome. That was really cool. Baptism and communion. We are also commanded to remember the atoning sacrifice through the taking of communion regularly. And I remember when we started the series and Peter preached on the Passover, we, uh, we took communion together, and that was powerful. And tonight... I want to do the same thing. I want to do the same thing. I want us to take communion together, and I want us to remember his atoning sacrifice. Now, if, around the room, there's, there's several baskets. There's a couple up here at the front. There's a couple in the back. But before we do this, I want us to do something. The Bible commands us that before we take communion, that we look at our own lives. The Bible tells us to, to, to be introspective and look at what's going on in here before we partake of communion. Actually, it's very serious about this. Uh, Paul has a bunch of instructions in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11. Um, by the way, the background of this, if you read through 1 Corinthians, the Corinthians were terrible people. They were, they were in church. They had church, but they were still terrible people. By the way, if somebody's a church person, doesn't mean they're a good person. <laughs> okay, there are some church people that are really terrible people, and the Corinthian church is an example of this. So Paul is writing them a letter, and he tells them what they're doing wrong and how they should be doing it. So in, in, in chapter 11 of his first letter to the Corinthians, this terrible group of people, he says this, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Can you imagine if, like, I was at home Right? And, or I was, let's say I was in, in Texas. That's where I'm from originally. And I wrote Chi Alpha UNC a letter. <laughs> right? And let's say I started, I started out, uh, it, well, not started out, but let's say in the letter I said this. I said, your meetings do more harm than good. <laughs> Wouldn't that be terrible? That'd be horrible. This is what's going on here. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, is it not the Lord's Supper you eat? For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry, and another person gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? 
What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Then in verse 23, he says this, For I received from the Lord, which I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink its cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then he, he, he concludes by saying this, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So worship team, you guys can come back up. See, the Lord says through Paul, he says, do not take the bread and the cup in vain. Don't just carelessly do it. Do you remember how we opened up in Leviticus and how Aaron's sons went before the Lord and they died? <laughs> because, because they went in carelessly without being clean before God. This is what happens when you go before God and you aren't clean. You die. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to die tonight. But symbolically, you die, right? So Paul warns the Corinthians. He says, you guys, you guys have been horrible. But I still want you to partake of the Lord's Supper. But before you do, please look inside first. And do not take the body and blood of Jesus in vain. Now, I want us to take communion together, but I want us to do this in a worthy manner. So before we take communion together, I want us to take a few minutes to just examine ourselves, to just examine ourselves. We're through taking notes. I don't really have anything else for you to take notes for. So we're just examining ourselves right now. I want you to know this, that there is nothing that can be hidden from God. There's nothing that can be hidden from Him. He knows what's going on, right? I, I want to be vulnerable with you for a second. For many years, I played Christian. I had been saved. I got saved in Chi Alpha as a college student. But then I played Christian. And I had all this sin in my life that I constantly did. And I did it in an unrepentant way. I wasn't sorry for my sins. Not just sins that I did to myself, but sins against other people. I would gossip about people. I would backbite about people. I would say things about them behind their back that would dishonor them. Have you noticed that in our Chi Alpha, we do the opposite? We honor people here, right? But this is not what I was doing, and I was playing church. And I remember in a moment at a church service that God convicted me, not of my outward sin, but of my secret sin, of the sin that no one else knew about. And I fell before the Lord and I asked for his forgiveness and he was quick to forgive me because he loves me. There is no sin that can cause God to not love me. So he was quick to forgive, but I had to be repentant of it. I had to tell him, Lord, I want you to take this from me. That secret sin that no one else knows about. I had sexual sin in my life. And even though I played church and I played, I was even a small group leader. Can I be more vulnerable with you? I was even a small group leader. And I had sexual sin in my life. And I went to Chi Alpha every week just, hey, you know. No one knew about it. It was absolutely secret. But when it came time to take the body and blood of the Lord, I took it in an unworthy manner. And I didn't die. <laughs> but I remember taking it in vain. The Bible says, shall we continue to sin so grace can abound? Absolutely not. 
If you think you can just sin because God has grace for us, you spit in his face. That's not what it's meant for. He has grace to forgive us, but we must be repentant. So we're gonna take communion together. Actually, let's all stand together. Well, you don't have to stand. If you wanna stand, go for it. Um, but we're just gonna take a look at our own lives. We're gonna take a look at our own lives for a few minutes. And feel free to move around the room if you need to be alone with God. It, absolutely. If you, if you need to be with a small group leader or, or a brother or a sister in Christ, be with them. If you need to confess your sins to somebody, your brothers and sisters in Christ aren't going to condemn you for it. They're actually going to rejoice with you because you're being cleaned before God. It's a joyous thing to confess your sins, not an embarrassing thing. Remember, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. We're all in this together. But it's a wonderful thing to confess them, and it's a joyous thing because we're clean before God. So I'm going to pray. Take a few minutes. Look at your life. Repent of your sins, even your secret sins, and then come grab a communion. There's a couple up here. There's a couple in the back. And we're not going to all do it together at once. Just take it on your own when you're ready. Okay? Cool? All right. Father, we love you. We love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for your first coming. Because when you came, Lord, you rescued us all. You saved us all. You saved us from the hell that we deserve. And it is by your grace and your mercy and your love that you gave us a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. And you're always forgiving and you're always loving. God, help us to have a holy hatred for our sin and a holy love for what is righteous. Help us to be clean before you, God. Our ultimate purpose is atonement, at one with you. Help us to be clean before you so that we can fellowship with you in a holy way. God, we love you and we confess our need for you. The things tonight that do not glorify you, God, would you pull them out of our lives and cast them out of our lives. God, we choose to repent, not just to feel sorry, but we choose to repent, to stop doing those things because we love you more than we love our sin. God, we love you. We trust you. We thank you for our brothers and our sisters in this room because we do not walk alone. We walk together. So Jesus, I love you. I thank you, God, for saving me. Somebody who does not deserve salvation, you saved me, God. You love me and you care for me deeply. And I cannot wait for your second coming. I cannot wait to stand before your judgment seat because I know I've been cleaned by you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Take a few moments, and when you're ready, come grab a communion.